I'm very happy to be here in Cody and in the Museum of Buffalo Bill. Um, I'm deeply honored that my work had now hanged in the Whitney Western Museum of Art in the same galleries as the exceptional artists who have given visual expression to the West we know and love. The collection evokes this grand landscape that is such a remarkable place on the continent. I've titled my talk, Hidden in the Wide Open, and the meaning will become apparent to you as we go along. But for now, it will remain hidden, as it was to me for many years. I'd like to begin uh, by showing you how my work changed from being figurative, this dates from the 90s, I mean from the 80s, 1980s, and uh, is life size. So how I, my work changed from this to this, which is the American number, American Fork number four that hangs in the gallery here. And this is about uh, seven feet high, completed in 2011. So I'd like to begin with my origins, which were in um, the coastal hills of Northern California in a town called Sonoma, and a very beloved place to me in the uh, oak forest that surrounded my home. As a youth, I played there and felt imaginatively and uh, physically a part of it. And to me, the dry grass, which is really yellow, is a common, I call a tonic note, uh, common to all the West. Again, another <clears throat> photo of the mixed forest in the Sonoma Valley. Uh, and I had a um, very disturbing experience when I was in my late teens on the uh, east side of the valley, very wooded, and it's where the Jack London State Park is. And I was walking back on a small path from the Wolf House, Jack London's Wolf House, and I wandered off the path and knelt in the grass, much like this place. I gradually had a, a feeling that I was being, that a sheet of glass was surrounding me and uh, separating me from the trees, the grass, and the brush. And I felt uh, alienated and separate. And I realized, of course, as a late teen, uh, that I really didn't feel connected. And this was about the time I was studying art formally. And uh, this is my current studio, and this is my table of uh, dry pastel. So I see painting, although I didn't see it at the time, but upon reflection, as a means, as a medium to get back to that place, a medium and a conduit. Uh, and so it's been a long search. After graduation, I moved for a short time to the um, Mississippi, and I did landscape pastels. I call them horizon studies. As you can see, they're from a distance. They are in the tradition I learned, which is the Euro-American tradition of landscape painting. Uh, they are through that picture window that was develop, developed during the Renaissance where the picture plane acts as a window and it's framed by the canvas, by the painting, and you look out into deep space of perspective. Although this is rather flattened, which shows you my sort of modernist um, education as well. This is from the 80s, again like the uh, painting I opened with. This is life size. This is a diptych, like the first one I showed you, uh, painted with egg tempera washes. And you'll notice that in one panel are the figures who happen to be my twin nieces who modeled for me. And in the other is a representation of the natural world. Uh, these are laurel leaves, which are indigenous to the Sonoma Valley. Of course, they also harken back 
to classical Greek origins. And this is another, this is a six foot painting. Again, the two panels, the division between nature and people. I also did some small paintings. These are also life size of birds. So this began my fascination with birds. I moved with my husband to the Rocky Mountain West. Uh, I do have uh, my maternal forebears did come from the Rocky Mountain West. I wanted to move here because I wanted to reverse the ratio between people and land. Sonoma County was getting too crowded for me and um, I wanted to feel and experience more the impact of landscape so I wanted to be here in the big west, the big open. So you're familiar with this, Thomas Moran. Uh, this is sort of the image that we were taught and that we look to as a visual definition of the West. Again, and this, you know this painting well, by Bierstadt, from the tradition of the Renaissance window, seeing nature from a distance. We have a little, my husband and I, a fishing cabin on the Continental Divide near Yellowstone. And uh, I set up a little studio out in the Doug Fir. These are my hands, charcoal, again, egg temper and charcoal, and a sticky geranium plant, which is uh, native. This is uh, aspen. This is uh, willow, found uh, along the Madison River. And this is autumn when the willow has lost its leaves. Then <clears throat> I got to know the uh, Rocky Mountain front, east front, north of Hel Helena. And as you know, that is quite a dramatic place to be, uh, and I found, uh, you know, you would just come upon fossils. And so, of course, that just takes you way back into geologic time. You're in another dimension. You're in another dimension of landscape. And uh, so this found its way in my work. This is egg tempera on the right. So this isn't a diptych, but it has sort of two zones. The other is my first introduction of oil into the egg tempera for, uh, surface. So that can mean a lot of things, reference a lot of things, not only water, but interior, human feelings, fluids, many things. This is a, sort of a mid-sized painting, again, fossils. And then this is, was my uh, representation of fit the human figure, this head, kind of the PBS head. And then uh, oil passages. So this is quite formal, becoming geometric, sort of looking to Richard Diebenkorn, actually, whom I'm, I, I love his work. I also uh, was burn heading more and more and look at this magnificent place to be surrounded by, to be immersed in. It's the 360 degree horizon. It is not the two dimensional. And I, I'm, I can't be more content than when I am in a place like that. And this is a place where I have deer hunted. Uh, and I love these little draws. You know, there are tens of thousands of these draws all across Montana uh, that are hidden away. And you go to these places where possibly no one has ever stepped foot. And um, you find things. You see things you don't see if you stay in your car. Now, out of that, grew these paintings. Uh, I call them Meditations on Hunting, taken from the Spanish philosopher's uh, essay by that name, uh, Ortega y Gasset. I learned something about hunting when I was first set setting off to hunt. 
And so these are abstractions. So this is a move to abstraction because I felt that through abstraction, I really could include more, not less, but more into my painting of my uh, full experience. So here I have the, the egg temper washes and the oil passages. That one was about five foot. This is a small one, about 18 inches. So these are uh, quite, I see them as formal. They're, they're based in landscape and my experience in landscape, but they are formal in the sense of composing uh, visual elements of shape, color, texture, value. So they're kind of more, as I look back on them now, they're more general in feeling. Then an important thing happened. Uh, I was at, in New York at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and I wandered into the pre-Columbian galleries, and there saw these feathered, uh, feather works by the Wari culture of what's now Peru in the mountains found, it was a cache of this work found in a mountain cave in the Andes. I was mesmerized and they felt familiar to me and I noticed how the feathers were in some instances cut to create a sharp line for the geometrics. I understood that these were feathers from birds that were hunted by people in a very particular place, in a very particular landscape. I was suddenly struck that I could use the feathers of birds that I hunted in this landscape. This is one last piece. This is a very large mural. That's about, dates from about the eighth century. So this is an example of one of my feather pieces. These are turkey uh, tail feathers, wild turkey tail feathers on paper, handmade paper, they're attached with thread. This is, these are the tail feathers of a blue grouse, mountain blue grouse, that are found in the high elevations in the mountains, so I get to go there too. <clears throat> they're attached with uh, thread. This incorporates both the tail feathers of the blue grouse and the rough grouse. Rough grouse are found along the uh, Riparian, the waterways, the creeks. Then I wanted to <clears throat> incorporate a mark <clears throat> with the feather. So I, the, the feather has an expression of its own. And so I wanted to sort of be in conversation with that, with my marks of pastel. This is dry pastel. These are the same thing, but uh, these feathers are the tail feathers of the Hungarian partridge. These are about uh, 42 inches wide and you know 52 inches high. So they're large paper, works on paper. And these are attached with, I changed from thread to using wire, very small gauge wire. Then waterfowl and uh, migratory birds, and uh, these are the neck pelts from the mallard drake. There are four neck pelts here that I uh, stretch and cure and scrape and cut into these formations and glue with the conservation glue to a wood panel that's about three quarters of an inch thick, and then I paint the edges of the of the wood. So each, I've done quite a few of these, and each one is unique because each bird is unique and has a unique design. This is a uh, white-tailed um, jackrabbit. And for me, these evoke, even though they're this big, they evoke vast space. And this is Canada goose. This is, um, snowshoe hair. Soon after I discovered the Wari feather works, not only was I doing um, feathers on paper, but uh, I wanted to, of course, get my oil paint going. And this is 
an egg tempered ground, but it's uh, oil, there, it's the feathers uh, sewn on to the attached with thread to the canvas, and then with a uh, brush stroke of oil. Again, sort of continuing the conversation between the animal and the place the animal's from and m me as the artist. These are uh, uh, pheasant tail feathers. So again, the same thing. Paying attention to the shape of the feather. So the shape of the feather really determined the um, shape of the canvas. The, the lines, the length of the lines. So you're really keen into the feather. As one walks around Montana and you go to these sort of remote places, you come across petroglyphs. Uh, they're all across Montana. They're all across the region. They're all across the world to be found. And so I see these as Montana's earliest painters, painters who were in conversation with their landscape, with their world. The ones I'll, I, I have shown you and will be showing you come from this cave, which is above the Smith River, which you can see below here. This is a paintbrush that was found in a um, pictographic cave south of Billings that has paint still on it and some residue from the sandstone uh, cave on which they think it was used. Not only is I, I bird hunted, but I also hunt for deer. And um, again, in places like this, to me, hunting is profound. It's a taking of a life and consuming a life. And it's a very intense and intimate experience, and it has taught me a lot. It has taught me to be, not to be afraid of the natural world because I've learned more about it. I'm in it. You know, you have to learn how to pay attention, how to behave, um, so I'm more comfortable. And hunting asks um, more of me, and I ask more of myself. Uh, this is one wall of my studio. I like, I like having these antlers to look at, and of course, like most hunters, it reminds me of the hunt, which is a very vivid memory. As you can see, I'm not a trophy hunter, I'm a meat hunter. I couldn't, when I scaled up, I really couldn't use feathers in my work. It didn't, the feathers were, were, were very, much more compatible with on paper, because they're dry and sort of papery. Uh, but scaling up and using oil and canvas, I shifted to using deer hide danglers, which I'm sure you're aware that um, Native Americans used these in their work. And so it's an acknowledgement to uh, Native American art and life ways. But I feel it's also, it's my hunting and my expression here you can see, let's see, them. I poke them through the back. And they function in many ways. They, um, they are a line, and they relate to other lines in the painting. They are, uh, they sort of come and go from the interior to the exterior. They are kind of, aggressive and so the the viewer has to deal with them these are six feet this is the one at the Whitney now this is more seven feet same size around seven feet this I began at U cross the, the next two paintings these have scaled up to eight feet um, I really like the scale. <clears throat> uh, I've worked on this painting, even though it's pretty sparse. I've worked on it for over a year. I started it a year ago, March, and completed it not so long ago. So March in New Cross, it was very uh, subdued color. 
no green grass yet, and so these paintings are quite subdued. And this is my last painting that I've completed. They have oil washes, which are the bigger areas. They have charcoal, they have dry pastel, they have the leather danglers, the deer hide danglers. Uh, they sometimes have pencil, oil. There are many mediums at work. And I see these, um, these circles, or I see them as nodes, or I see them, some people see them as uh, energy points. Um, they are, they are particulars, whereas my early um, uh, abstract uh, works were more general in feeling. These, I feel, are more particular and really more of an expression of particular experiences in landscape. They're just more concrete. Even though they're abstract, they're more concrete. And they, um, I see them as condensations of my experience of hearing birdsong, of touching grass, of, uh, you know, crickets, everything. You're just very aware out there when you're in it. I would like to say in my closing remarks that uh, over time, I have come to experience the West as a place of deep time and place. Our deepest selves lie here, buried in fossils, in images hidden in caves that the human hand has made in conversation with the natural world. I feel privileged that I've had the opportunity to live and walk such a magnificent land and feel a part of it through art. Well, the early ones, I didn't uh, dip in, um, in a rabbit skin glue because I want to protect them from the oil paint because oil paint um, can deteriorate uh, fabric. That's why we put primers on canvas before we paint with oil. And so that makes them hard and makes them stand up when you dip them in the rabbit skin glue when they dry. And I like that they are because when you're in landscape, there are thistles and thorns and burrs, and you might get bitten by something. And so I just feel it's a very, sort of evokes a very real element of landscape. Well, one example I might give is when I was bird hunting, and we were in with my husband, and um, he likes to tell the story because uh, we were we had entered this sort of patch, this glade, is sort of an eastern word, but a an area that was patchy with brush and trees and aspen. And I said, "Grouse will be here." <clears throat> I think grouse will be here. And he said, well, "How do you know?" <laughs> and well, part of it is just experience because the more you, times you see grouse rise up. <clears throat> From a particular place, the more you sort of know when you're in that place. But it also has to do with patterns, uh, the size of the leaf, uh, patterns of light and dark, patterns of color. Um, you know, you, you know that birds want to have an escape route, so you're aware of spatial uh, uh, distances. Uh, so you just start becoming attuned to that with, uh, without being aware of it. And all those terms, space, pattern, value, color, those are all art terms. Those are the elements of art. That's what artists work with. So there's a direct connection. Because really, the elements of art, those visual elements, derive, in my opinion, from landscape. I mean, and we are landscape. And I don't even like the word landscape, which is another subject entirely, because it's a word that distances up us. It comes from a European point of view, where there's a separation, it implies a separation, and that we're not a part of the natural world. And as we all are beginning, at least immigrant Americans are beginning to understand that we're not, we are a part, we're not separate. We're all made of the same stuff, the same DNA.
Yes, it's true. Um, I just read in the, uh, on some of the cards in the um, Plains Indian Museum that the men tended to paint uh, more representationally and women more geometrically. So um, it is, I mean, you can't put it all on the canvas. And as I say, for me, it's a condensation. It's taking everything that I experience, we experience with our bodies, all our senses, our minds, our memories, and condensing it. I don't like the word um, essence. That leaves things out. But condensing it, so somehow it's all in there. Uh, someone, when they look at these large paintings of mine, say they feel both uh, big space and things close at hand, you know, the physicality of some of those circles, the physicality of the, um, the danglers, that it is like, uh, you know, when you're out there, up in the skies above you, the ground is below you, you're touching a particular mound of grass. As I say, it's concrete and all that is sort of implied in the placement of that circle in relation to other things. I don't know, it just happens over time. Well, you, these colors really, I'm sorry, I hope you go see the painting in the gallery. Um, well, you can see that my uh, colors are I have a warm palette, mostly. Um, well, and early on when I was using a tempera, I used uh, pigment, bags of colors. I mixed my own paint with the egg. With the egg. Um, so those are earthy. I've always been, from the very beginning, very uh, stressed. I've emphasized materials. They're the, they're the things that do the work. I really want my materials to be the things that grab you. Um, so pigments are from the earth. I like the natural. Uh, uh, I want paint with acrylic. Uh, oil, natural. Um, charcoal from the willow, burnt willow. So they're just, they feel better and they say more, they communicate more what I want to communicate. Well, yeah, I would say with those uh, U-cross paintings, the latter very large ones, the, uh, the landscape was so bare and so stripped that, um, you know, I started them at U-cross. I had them all mapped out, and I was doing, uh, using <clears throat> the pastel and developing them with the pastel, and then I brought them home to develop them with the oil, but they just would not take a further development, a further richness, because that landscape was not that way at that time. So I felt I couldn't do it. And you know, the marks you make, they have to be authentic. You have to be together when you go into the studio, physically, spiritually, emotionally, to make those marks and to make, and you know if they're not a true mark and you erase it. So uh, 